There's a strange passage in the canon where the Buddha talks about how we take the potential for a form or feeling, perception, fabrication, or consciousness, and we fabricate it into an actual aggregate of form, feeling, etc., for the sake of having that aggregate. It's expressed in a strange way in the Pali. But the basic message is, all our experiences is for the sake of something. This is why we have questions about what is the meaning of life, hoping that somehow the for the sake of can be determined. Otherwise, we're pretty much making stamps in the dark, trying to figure out what will make us happy. Usually that's what the for the sake of is, to find happiness of some kind. And we do our best to find some pleasure. The question is, is our best good enough? As the Buddha pointed out, we end up usually operating in ignorance, which means that we end up creating suffering. We're ignorant of what we're doing. And our ideas of what, what's worth doing and what's not worth doing, they can be really skewed, because our perceptions are skewed. There are four aberrations of perception the Buddha talks about, seeing constancy in things that are inconstant. Seeing ease in things that are stressful, seeing self in things that are not self, and seeing beauty in things that are not beautiful. Those are the big ones. But if you look at how the mind operates, there are lots of variations on those things. Because every time we do something, think something, say something, it's for the purpose of something. And we think it's worth it. And basically what discernment tells us is a lot of things that we think are worth doing are not worth doing at all. So we have to learn how to develop some dispassion for them so we can get out of them. Because they tend to be like ruts in the mind. The Buddha uses the word bending the mind. We keep thinking in certain ways and the mind gets bent in those directions. Nowadays we say they're like ruts, a rut in a road. You get stuck in the rut, and it takes a lot of energy to get out. Otherwise the mind just follows its own patterns again and again and again. Even though there may not be much allure, it's just simply what it's familiar with. So one of the purposes of meditation is to try to get out of those ruts, think in new ways. Think it cross purposes with the ruts. If you ever tried to get out of a rut in the road, you notice you have to turn the wheel at a really sharp angle. So you learn how to learn how to think in new ways. One of the major causes of ruts in the mind is that we have certain ways of thinking. There may be one alternative or two alternatives that are worth doing, or that are worth thinking about. And when you have only two alternatives, well, it's like politics. You think of all the wonderful people who could be really good presidents in the United States, but somehow the sorting out situation gets down to two people who are not really worth it at all. And we get really worked up about which one is the lesser of two evils trying to see that the lesser of two evils is actually something good. But the problem is the sorting out process. Well, it's the same with the mind. The mind has this way of sorting out things, saying well, this has to be that way, that has to be this way. And so when you find the mind in a right, you have to ask yourself, is there another possibility? 
Maybe there are three or four possibilities. Or maybe we're asking the wrong question. As I said, often we find ourselves doing things that we know are harmful that cause suffering. We ask ourselves, what's the allure? Doesn't seem to be much. It's because we've caught ourselves in a box. So when you find yourself faced with two alternatives like that, ask yourself, maybe there's something else. Maybe there's another way of dividing up the territory. That whole issue of, I do everything just for me, 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 and it becomes a very horrible me. And as long as you think there's only one in there, it's really difficult to figure out exactly what is it that the, the me wants. But when you start dividing it up, you say there are lots of little me's in there. And what does this me want right now? What does that me want right now? That changes things. You're not stuck with just two alternatives or one alternative. So learn how to turn your thoughts inside out. We know that the Buddha's analysis of things is the way you gain insight. You should look for the origination of something. The origination is in the, in the mind itself, and the Buddha uses the word origination. It's not just arising, it's something is caused, and it's caused from within the mind. So when a certain thought pattern comes up, try to look and see when it arises, what's coming up with it, or what's pushing it into your mind. And sometimes these thoughts seem to arise simply because of the force of past karma, but there'll be a present karma addition. Look for that. In fact, the Pali word for origination, samudaya, means something arising together. So what's coming up together at the same time? And we like to talk about deep underlying causes, but maybe it's right there on the surface, so, so much on the surface that we look right through it. And then try to see when that thought, if it's allowed to pass away on its own, how did it pass away? Because in the end you'll see there's part of the mind that's not allowing it to pass away. That's the part you want to look at. And what's the allure driving that? And sometimes they'll just say, well, this is just the way it has to be. That's why you find yourself ending up doing things that you know are really not all that good and don't have that much allure. But you've blocked off better alternatives. So you want to see that sorting out process. How did you block them out? So when you see that, then you begin to understand the allure of certain things. Because you really the allure is not so much in the thought, it's the in the way of thinking that's got you trapped. Not something we'll learn how to stand out of. Again, it's hard to figure out exactly precisely what the problem is, unless you have a place to stand outside. That's what the breath provides. You can be with the breath coming in, breath going out bathing your body in the breath, bathing your own sense of you in the breath, you inhabiting the body. You want to fully inhabit the body. So you can get out of your mind, at the very least get out of the discussion inside. Have a chance to rest from that. This is why we talk about the karate chops, because sometimes your old thoughts will come in. You can have a quick retort to get them out of the way. This is one of the reasons why we read those books of short Dharma passages by John Fuyong and John Lee, John Cha. Because it gives some ideas how you can step out of your thoughts. You see a student coming to say something really stupid to John Fuyong, and he's got a quick retort. But sometimes he doesn't seem all that stupid to begin with, but he's got a good retort. 
And where did he learn that ability? Well, learning how to use it with himself. And that he was sitting around trying to think of clever things to say to people. He was trying to think of clever things to do with his own defilements. Cut them out for the time being. So you can give some space for the mind to settle down. And when it's settled down, that's when you can do the real work. Beginning to see the assumptions that place limitations on your thoughts. Because those are the things that have the allure. This way you can start questioning things more in the sense of why do you like this way of thinking? And part of the mind will say, well, this is the way things are. This is the way I put together my reality, and it's worked good enough for me. But if it's really worked good enough, it's not going to cause you suffering like this. They discover that as children develop, it's not that they simply add new information to what they've had before. They go through periods where they develop a paradigm, their understanding of the world. And then finally the new information gets so dissonant with their understanding of the world that they've got to drop the old paradigm, drop the old structure of their thoughts, come up with something new. That's how they grow. That's how they mature. The problem is, as adults, we've figured out we've got our structure and it works. And the Buddha is saying, no, the way you structure your thinking is causing you to suffer. So you have to look at the larger pattern, because that's, as I said, where the allure lies. And when you can see the drawbacks of that, then it's a lot easier to get, get rid of the individual thoughts that are coming in driving you crazy. So the ruts in the mind are not so much individual thoughts, it's patterns of thinking that we hold to. This is one of the reasons why it's so important that we say that as we're bringing the Dharma to the West, we shouldn't be in so, such a great hurry to make the Dharma fit in with our views of reality, because our views of reality are making us suffer. The Dharma is offering us another way of looking at things. Learn how to use a teaching on karma. Learn how to use a teaching on rebirth in a skillful way. So you can come up with new narratives, new patterns of thinking that don't cause you to suffer. So think outside the ruts. Turn at sharp angles from them. It takes effort, because you have to figure out exactly where the ruts are. And since you're in the ruts, they just seem a very natural place to be. But the mind doesn't have to stay in those ruts. That's the good news. It's simply a matter of learning how to take that good news and seeing how you can apply it to the way the mind is making itself suffer. And you can let go of the things that you think are worth holding on to until you see that they really do cause you to suffer. And they don't have to. And you don't have to think in those terms. That's when the Dharma gets liberating.